गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू द ब्लैक होल इस्लाम अथॉरिटेरियनिज़म एंड अंडर डेवलपमेंट अ ग्लोबल एंड हिस्टोरिकल कंपेरिजन इस दिलचस्प और अहम मौजू पर आज हमारी गुफ्तु होने लगी है वी हैव अ स्पेशल गेस्ट विद अस ऑन जूम प्रोफेसर अहमद टी कुरु uh, आप हैं प्रोफेसर ऑफ पॉलिटिकल साइंस एट सैन डियागो स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी आज के सेशन की मॉडरेशन की जिम्मेदारी हमारी रिक्वेस्ट पर डॉक्टर प्रवेश हूद भाई निभाएंगे आप सब लोगों से एक दरख्वास्त है हमेशा की तरह के प्लीज़ अपने सेलफोन जो हैं वो साइलेंट मोड में कर लें सो दैट देर इज़ नो डिस्ट्रैक्शन जब सवाल जवाब के लिए सेशन ओपन होगा तो जस्ट रेज योर हैंड और माइक्रोफोन अपने हाथ में आने के बाद बोलिएगा उसके बगैर आपकी आवाज़ उन तक भी नहीं जाएगी और ऑनलाइन ऑडियंस के पास भी नहीं पहुँचेगी शॉर्ट और टू द पॉइंट रहिएगा ताकि गुफ्तु जो है वो मौजू के गिरती घूमें नाउ वी विल स्टार्ट दिस सेशन थैंक यू Thank you, Nayyar. You see the topic that is there on the board. It's before you. It's a matter of extraordinary importance because there are something like forty-seven or forty-eight countries of the world where the majority is Muslim. If one looks at these countries, one sees that, as a rule, they are far behind in matters of human development. in science in uh, in in terms of the size of their economy as well now how did this come to be certainly this was not always the case there was a time far back in the past from the 9th till till the 13th centuries maybe the 12th when islam was the dominant civilization the globe but something happened what exactly happened and why did this situation come to be what it is today is going to be explained to us by professor ahmed kuru of san diego state university he's written this marvelous book called uh, islam authoritarianism and under development which is a very solid piece in which he has looked at data over the centuries and from various sources brought together the relevant facts he also has another book which is on secularism in muslim countries and why it did not take root over there he has a particular explanation for it so now i would like to introduce to you professor ahmed kuru uh, Ahmed, uh, can you hear me? Are you there? This um, you will very shortly be on um, the screen in front of the audience. Yes, I am here, and uh, I hear you nicely. Very happy and honored to be with you today, though it's uh, still online. Oh, good, good. Now we can all see you. We can see you smiling, and <laughs> it's uh, good to meet you. So, uh, Ahmed, what I would suggest is that. Uh, you present your uh, thesis and uh, if you don't mind at uh, selective points i will interject and ask you for an explanation or maybe challenge you on something if that's okay with you great 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 okay so then uh, the floor is all yours thank you so much dr pervez would be hoy for inviting me to the black hall your prestigious discussion platform I am very happy I've been following your work for many years and it's an honor to be with you today to discuss this very important matter. And Pakistan is particularly an important country, you know in Turkey we consider Pakistanis and Turks are brothers as brothers and sisters. And since the publication of my Islam book 4 years ago, two countries appear to be the most engaging one. of course in addition to american and british academia the two country two muslim majority countries one is indonesia the other is pakistan i'm very happy to have an engagement with intellectual scholars and all kind of readers in these two countries and hopefully i look forward to having a personal visit to pakistan i had the chance to visit indonesia last year and look forward to a possibility to visit pakistan 
And my book was translated into Indonesian, and I look forward to a possible translation to Urdu, hopefully. So you start oh, we very already, well. We've already grabbed that uh, offer. Um, okay. And in fact, some of the people who will be responsible for that are sitting in the audience. Uh, th that That's very good to hear. Thank you so much. That's a big encouragement. So Dr. Hood, before you started very well about the puzzle I start with. I'm a political scientist. I'm not a historian. And I start with a very contemporary problem. When we look at the Muslim majority countries, I will show some numbers and figures and maps in my presentation in a few seconds. It show a crisis. Then it became even more puzzling when we know about the early achievements of Muslims historically. But in addition to taking this as a book project, I also consider it a life long question starting since my childhood as a muslim growing up in turkey i always i have been hearing about the collapse of the ottoman empire the general intellectual decline in the muslim world that's why i started the book about an anecdote between my father and a secularist general so how they debate and how as a child I started to be intrigued by the debate. So let me now share the PowerPoint presentation. As you emphasize, the title took Islam with two negative concepts. Again, some of my family members criticized me for the title and I explained them that after studying Islam and democracy for a, over a decade... Can you, can you maximize this, yeah. please? Sure. I came to the conclusion that... I hope it's better now. I came Much to the better. conclusion that instead of using the title Islam and democracy, we have to use what is in the ground, what we observe, and what Muslims societies put as a reality in front of us, which is authoritarianism and underdevelopment. And when we look at the map, as you see now, out of about 200 countries, a quarter are Muslim majority. And among these roughly 49, 50 Muslim majority countries, very few are elected democracies, despite the fact that most of the countries in the world are electoral democracies. And this problem of authoritarianism coexists with the problem of socioeconomic underdevelopment. GNI per capita, literacy rate, schooling, life expectancy. Let me emphasize one point here that when I put the puzzle in front of the academia, interestingly, it wasn't simply Muslims who came with a critical view and question how, how are you as a uh, as, as someone grew up in the Muslim world, write a book to criticize these societies. But interestingly, American academics happen to be agnostic, atheist, Christian, or whatever religious background. Because of this new, very dominant postmodern emphasis, they, squ they question, Ahmed, what do you mean by development? Is are fuzzy terms? And I said, no, look, I have very clear criteria about literacy rates, schooling, GNI per capita, and we can extend the list about Nobel Prize winners and others. And when we document the dependent variable, now the next issue is, of course, independent variable. What is the explanation? And from the policy circles to daily life, from America to the Muslim world, there are two main counter arguments. One is blaming Islam the other blaming European colonization or Western imperialism. For many secularists in the Muslim world or certain academics, we call them essentialists in social science, Islam as an entity hinders democracy and development. Whereas others, we can call them post-colonialists and others, and including certain Islamists, they blame Western imperialism as the evil, a mother of all evils. So my position is that I took both arguments very seriously. 
in each chapter in the book, I try to engage them seriously, but at the same time, try to show their weaknesses. Because Islam was perfectly compatible with progress from 8 to 12 centuries. There are multiple Islams. Even today, there exists a variation of interpretations. When it comes to colonization, it's, it, to make the long story short, chronologically stagnation bef start before colonization, at least in the Middle East and North Africa, if not in South Asia. Chronologically, 19th century colonization began, Muslims already had intellectual stagnation. And there are many decolonized countries achieving democracy development. Why not in the Middle East and other parts of the Muslim world? Last but not least, normatively focusing on the foreign uh, variable, blaming others, cover up domestic problems. That I argue that we have to focus on domestic issues to really solve all problems. The third argument, as you see here, is more scientific. Uh, it's a new institutionalist argument from Douglas North to Darana Jemolo today. They emphasize institutions. I am much friendlier with this argument, but still saying that if the problem is bad institutions, extractive institutions, who build institutions? Where do they come from? And my position is that institutions came from human beings, especially four human classes. I call four social classes political, religious, academic, and economic. When And this, my argument is very general. At least I try to present it explaining both the Muslim world and Western Europe. Because in both regions, when there was certain level of separation of the four classes, when each has some autonomy, we have creativity, dynamism, productivity, and certain level of justice. Until the 11th century, Western Europe did not have a strong bourgeois class. Western Europe lacked a, an intellectual class. Instead, they had clergy state alliance. And this clergy military aristocracy alliance create what we call the Dark Ages in general in Western Europe. And at that time, therefore, as you see in this slide, Muslim world was relatively more developed. We can call it was supreme in terms of philosophy and economy because they had certain level of separation between the religious class and political class. And they were very vibrant intellectual and bourgeois classes. Of course, after the 11th century, Muslim supremacy was not simply replaced by Western European supremacy. No, there were a period, what I call comparable levels of development in philosophy and natural sciences, in economy, until roughly 1700, after which we see the supremacy of Western Europe because of the rising bourgeoisie and intellectual class in Europe, Whereas in the Muslim world, what I call ulama state alliance, and some Pakistani friends call mili Mullah military nexus, and this partnership between religious class and political class is a big transformation happen in the Muslim world. So some analysts may disagree with me about the negative consequences, but it's a fact that after the 11th century, there emerged a very strong partnership that did not exist before in the Muslim world. So what exists before was really the coexistence of independent ulama with very creative polymaths. By ulama, I refer to both, in today's terminology, Sunni and Shia scholars, like Abu Hanifa, Jafar Sadiq, and polymath includes Harezmi, a mathematical thinker and scholar 
who develop certain mathematical formula and the Muslims learn Indian math, taught it to Europeans. That's why Europeans and Americans call the numbers Arabic numerals and algebra, algorithm, many concepts came from Arabic in English and other Western languages. Razi was a medical doctor and philosopher. He differentiated certain viruses and bacteria. Ibn Haysam was the innovator of prototype of modern camera. So he produced camera obscura, dark room. Farabi, both a metaphysical philosopher and musician. Ibn Sina, metaphysical philosopher and medical scientist. And Biruni was a geographer and astronomer uh, to some extent. And the fact that Muslim ulama scholars put a distance between themselves and political authority, create an environment for these polymaths exist and produce. So we have many anecdotal evidence in the life story of Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, in addition to, of course, Shia scholars. And the reason why they put a distance between themselves and rulers is a very complex and well-documented fact start all the way with the Sifin War, Karbala, and they came to realize that a good scholar should not serve a ruler. Abu Hanifa was offered to be judged by the Abbasi Caliph, and he refused. When the Caliph asked him to give a reason, he said, I am not qualified. Then the Caliph became outraged and said, you are a liar, you are the most qualified. Then Abu Hanifa said, how come a liar become a judge? Then they put him in prison and poisoned to death. And these anecdotal evidences are supported by important books and articles with numbers. In Quan's article, as I figure here, out of 3,900 ulama from Egypt to Eastward, only 9% was, were receiving public money. 91% had multiple private jobs, mostly coming from commerce, but a long list of private jobs they held. If we look at today, Turkey's Diyanet, Egypt's LSR and Grand Mufti Office, Iran's Mullah class from the lower level clergy to supreme leader of Iran, most of them engage politically and financially with political offices. And this Muslim world, coexistence of Christian Muslim Jews and learning from Greek sciences and making their own contributions and the ulama's separation from political authority were an important pillars of what we call Muslim golden age. And it started to end in the 11th century. What happened in the 11th century was very interesting set of transformations in both the Muslim world and Western Europe. Because in Western Europe, by the 11th century Gregorian reforms, when the Pope declared that the kings no longer would be able to intervene election of popes, the separation between the church and the royal authorities started to be institutionalized in the 11th and 12th centuries Europe. In addition to opening of universities in Europe, which eventually gave birth to an intellectual class, and the rise of Italian city-states, which gave birth to bourgeoisie in the 11th and 12th centuries. Interestingly, in the same two centuries, the Muslim world took a very different path. It started with an economic crisis in the Iraqi field with the decline of fertility and agricultural production. First Abbasids, then Buyuts and Selchuks came out of cash. That's why the royal authorities started to pay the salaries of military and civilian officers by distributing land. And that's what we call Iqta system of semi-feudal economic transformation. In the Ottoman Empire, it was called the Tamar system. The central government allocate lands and land revenues. This replaced the old system of market economy. And these marginalized merchants, 
these marginalized landowners. And therefore, scholarship having hard time to be funded by private sector. Then came a religious, as in addition to this economic transformation, there was also a religious transformation. In my analysis, I always try to look this, at the structure and agency. If the economic structure changing, there were also agents taking place, and one of them was the Abbasi Caliph Qadir. He, you look at this map now, and he was aware of the map. And when you look at the map, you see in the 11th century how Shia political forces dominate the Middle East and North Africa. The Fatimids in Egypt and the rest of North Africa claim an alternative Shia caliphate. Karmatis claim a Shia domination in the Arabian Peninsula. Hamdani is a Shia group in northern Syria, and Buyuts, another Shia force, even in Baghdad itself. Abbas Caliph Qadir started to create a Sunni reaction to call the Ghaznavids, as you see in the part of today's Pakistan, and other Sunni forces to unify them, Abbas Qadir tried to unify them against these Shia forces. So let me show the transformation in this slide. So as I said, there were economic factors leading the rise of ICTA system of land revenue distribution as, as a way of state dominating economy in the semi-feudal ICTA system. Plus, there was an ideological theological factor, what we call the rise of Sunnism. Until that time, there were no clearly defined Sunni or Shia orthodoxy. There were multiple Ashari, Hanafi, Hanbali, Shafi groups. But Abdul Qadir, Al Qadir, the Abbasi Caliph, declared a creed we call today Qadir Creed or Aqidai Al Qadir, where he defined three enemies for Sunnis to unify against. One enemy was Mu'tazili, rationalist philosophers or rationalist theologians who said the Quran is the creation of God, not the word of God. And Qadir said they are infidel to be punished. The second was certain Shias, especially Ismaili Shias. The third one is non-practicing Muslims. And his call eventually was embraced by a, a Turkish military warrior class, the Selchuks. And the Selchuks established an empire with a military conquest mentality. First, certain part of Central Asia, then moved to Iran and Iraq. And then they came to Baghdad at the time of Qadir's son, Qaim, was the caliph. And the daughter of Qaim and the son of Selchuk Sultan got married. That represents a new alliance between military state and religious authority. As you see, there are structural factors with certain strong agency. Abbasi Caliphs, Selchuk Sultans, Grand Vizier of Selchuk Empire Nizam and Mulk, and some scholars like Great Ghazali were part of this transformation. So now let me continue with a joke in this series conversation. When I was writing the project, I emailed a friend of mine with a Turkish origin and ask him, what do you think? He said, Ahmed, you prove that we Turks destroyed Islamic civilization. I said, no, my friend, this was not my intention. It's wrong because it's a joint achievement of Turks, Arabs, and Persians, because Abbasid Caliphs were Arab. Selçuk Sultans, yes, they were Turkic. Nizam al -Mulk was a Persian, so was Ghazali. So that was the joke. And what is the institutional result? The institutional result was that since merchants and scholars started to be marginalized with the new system, the state came in to fill the vacuum and Grand Wazir Nizam al Mulk initiated madrasas, what we call today Nizamiya madrasas, which has a very narrow curriculum, excluding mostly 
philosophy and taking Islamic sciences in a very literalist way. So now that I have a few points remain before the end of the presentation. One point is the role of Mongols and Crusaders. Similar to debate about modern European colonization, some people rightly ask about Mongols and Crusaders and say, didn't they really destroy Muslim Golden Age? My answer is yes and no. No, because chronologically problems began before Mongols and Crusaders. Yes, Mongols and Crusaders unintentionally helped the ulema state alliance because when they killed the people, destroyed the cities, especially Mongol massacres, they encouraged Muslims to focus on survival. The Muslims look at military heroes, and the military heroes came in the form of Saladin. He gave birth to AUBs, then Mamluks in Syria, Palestine, and Egypt today. And under the rule of first Zengis, who educated Saladin, then the Mamluks, Madrasas started to be open in Aleppo, Damascus, Cairo, and this ulema city system moved from Iraq to westward. And under the Mamluks, they were becoming very institutionalized. Of course, ideas and institutions went together. There were eminent scholars to promote ulema state alliance, and one of them is Ibn Taymiyyah. There is no verse in the Quran either about the ulema class or the state. But there is a phrase asking Muslims to obey who has authority, ulul amr minkum. And this phrase asks Muslims to follow those who have authority. But who has the authority? Ibn Taymiyyah says ulul amr minkum means ulama and umara. And umara basically state and ulama, ulama. So he turned ulema state alliance into Quranic order, which became very difficult to challenge. Don't make mistakes. Muslim kept producing cutting-edge thinkers, even during this problematic era. But these thinkers were either persecuted in the case of Ibn Rushd or forgotten in the case of Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Rushd's great commentary on Plato's Republic today exists is only, is, as only Hebrew translation because its Arabic origin was destroyed by Muslims during that time. And the Kerimi merchants and other merchants were also marginalized by the Mamluk force in Egypt and Syria. And we have a Canadian scholar who collect the occupational terms of the era. For example, in today's terminology, occupational terms like bank manager, CEO, CFO, as you see in this table, between 8th and 11th centuries, the number of occupational terms around 200, and then 12th and 15th centuries, slightly decline, but the occupational terms about state and ulema jump from 100 to 500. So, their resources and capacity expanding. So finally, we came to the three empires, Ottoman, Safavi, Mughal. They were powerful. They showed that Muslims recover politically and militarily after Mongol and Crusader invasions. But they were never intellectually recovered. Scientific innovation never happened again after 15th, 16th centuries. And Europe at the time was progressive using three Chinese instruments, gunpowder, compass, and printing press. Out of the three, Muslims only took gunpowder because the military commanders in the policymaking circle realized and pick up this technology. But there was no scholarly class in the decision-making table. It was only ulama, and unfortunately ulama regarded printing press as a threat to their cultural monopoly, their discursive monopoly. That's why Muslims about 300 years didn't take printing press. What is the result? I calculated the number of books Ottoman printers printed in the 18th century, only 50,000. 
But during the same century, estimate number of printed book in Europe, one billion. So that's how Muslims in Ottoman Empire end up with 1% literacy rate, whereas Europe surpassed 31% in 1800, which is the beginning of my question, why literacy rate low today? So it has this historical origin. Of course, then came European colonization with very negative effects. And the Muslim reformists, from the rulers to intellectuals, reply. From Istanbul to Cairo, there were modernist attempts. But for the last 200 years since the Ottoman Tanzimat of 1839, modernist attempts mostly failed, not completely, but they couldn't fulfill the promise. The reason I argue is that they, were, they have been very statist. They are almost anti-intellectual, anti-bourgeoisie. Then they co-opted with Islamists and ulama, and in, even in Turkey and Egypt since 1950s, 60s, they produced versions of ulama state alliance with Diyanet and LSR. And after the Islam Islamist revolution in Iran, of course, Islamization brought ulama in the forefront of politics. And these regimes mostly fueled and supported by oil money from Iran to Saudi Arabia, in my calculation, there are 28 oil-based countries in the world, and 22 of them are Muslim majority. So let me conclude here to say that Islam is not the culprit. Colonization is not the primary cause either. In yes, institutions matter, but who built them? Who built these extractive institutions? And my book argues that it is the ulama state alliance with ideology and power to do so. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer if there are any questions. Thank you, thank you, Ahmed, that was wonderful. You, you made your point very concisely. You have very deep knowledge of history. Mine is um, only at the level of an interested observer. But uh, I have a number of questions to ask you. Well, f you say that the Islamic golden age uh, extended from the 8th century through the 11th or the 12th century. Okay, so that makes it, let's say, 400 years. But Islam is 14, 1,500 years old. Okay, so that means four out of, 400 out of 1,500, which is not a very uh, big fraction. Further, the impetus towards learning in Islamic culture came entirely, entirely from the absorption of Greek learning. And it was the translations, as we very well know, that started in Baghdad roughly in the year 820-850 that led to the birth of learning, not the rebirth, but the birth of learning in Islamic culture, and which made it then such a powerful and a dominant player in the world. Now, that died out, and in your book you uh, say Imam Ghazali was, um, was instrumental in fighting against the rationalists, against the Motuzila, and that's absolutely true. But then you go on and make the further claim that it's because the merchant class which uh, became less important and the ulema who became more important that Islamic civilization closed its doors to ijtihad, closed its doors to further progress. I think I've understood you correctly on this. Is that correct? Yes, go ahead. Please. Okay, yes. good. Now. Is the ulema actually to blame for this? Uh, look, uh, you had two big figures over there. One was Al-Farabi, the other was Ibn Sina. And they were both rationalists, they were both Motazila, they were both powerful exponents of the power of reason. And these two are bitterly attacked by uh, the biggest philosopher in Pakistan, the biggest philosopher that this subcontinent has produced, and that is Allama Iqbal, who, uh, who says that, who are these people, Farabi and Sina 
and Ibn Hashem and Khwarizmi and so forth, they merely copied what was given to the Greeks and they made some little changes in it and it's not, it's not genuine Islamic learning. And in fact, during General Ziaul Haq's time, the Motazila were flayed as being enemies of Islam. So, now my question to you is, you are saying that um, Islam is theologically not opposed to the idea of um, rationality, of progress, of science, etc. And yet for a thousand years, look, it's a thousand years since the 11th century to now, why has this equilibrium main, been possible to maintain? What's your take on this? Thank you very much. So now I need 45 minutes to answer your questions. <laughs> but these are really great questions. And let me start saying that I think your knowledge of history is very deep because I recently read your new book on Pakistan. And it, it was very helpful for me to understand Iqbal, Mevdudi, and major great thinkers and general structural conditions in Pakistan in comparison to Bangladesh. So thank you for writing the new book on Pakistan. About the questions, let me emphasize three notes I took quickly. One issue is the 14th century versus five, six centuries. Uh, the precious times in terms of democracy, in terms of scientific progress, are very rare in world history. If you look at, for example, Western democracy, it's only 200 years old. And then if we really, really look at succeed, uh, achievements, it's after 1945, because in 1945, I'm just giving this as an example to comparative insight. Uh, until the defeat of Nazis, 1945, there are only there were only 12 democracies in the world, and most Europeans were fascistic, not only Nazis and under them, but also Italy, Spain, Portugal. So it, it's it, it is human beings are a problematic beings they very rarely produce good things at the very high scale in terms of democracy and development and even the uh, my country united states democracy is under challenge we put effort 200 years for some analysts america became democratic only after 1960s and now we have trump and the uh, capital storm and everything it's, it's very difficult to hold something dear and precious. The Muslim world was lucky and successful to have this golden age from 8th to 12th century and then lost it. But they didn't lost it completely because we didn't have 1,000 years of ignorance. No. It's a relative terms. For example, in the 13th century, we had Ibn Rushd. 14, early 15th century, we have Ibn Khaldun. Later on, there are some great scholars like Jurjani and Taftazani. In the 17th century, there was Mullah Sadra in Iran and Katib Chelemi, Haji Khalifa in the 17th century Ottoman Empire. There were pockets of reforms, progress, and certain level of intellectual development and in the, in the Mughals, some economic flourishing, etc. So that's one thing I want to emphasize. The matter of degree, achievement is very rare. It's not 1,000 years of darkness. No, there, there are constant resistance, change. But of course, these ulama state line remain fairly strong. Then the question, how come it was so strong and longevity of it? First of all, there were backlashes. The Ottomans and the, uh, especially Mahmoud II, Muhammad Ali Pasha, then Mahmoud II's legacy represented by Atatürk, Muhammad Ali Pasha represented by Jamal Abdul Nasser. And this back, despite the backlashes, Ulema State Alliance stayed very long. 
And I explain it by, by three very basic reasons. One is that they present their position as a, a doctrine of Islam. In the presentation, I briefly mentioned Ibn Taymiyyah, Ulul Amr Minkum interpretation. In the book, I look at a fabricated hadith which says religion and state are twins. Religion is the foundation, state is the guardian that without foundation collapses that without the guardian perishes. Since there is no hadith about ulema state alliance, the post 11th century scholars fabricated this Sasani maxim. Normally it was King Ardashir of the funding Sasani king said that religion and state are twins 300 years before Prophet Muhammad salam. But this fabricated hadith even today Muslims and non-Muslim scholars present it as if it is a pillar of Islam, which is not. Throughout my book, I try to deconstruct this kind of fallacies. But they became important because in every mosque, they preach in California. Wherever I go for Friday khutbah, even I am now here joining you from New York. Just yesterday in the khutbah, again, the imam says, Kullu bidatin dalalat, kullu dalalatin finnar. All innovations are deviations or deviations are in the hellfire. Normally, there were thousands of hadiths. And it is bida itself to keep repeating this in every hutbah because it's not something the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ kept repeating in the hutbahs. But this way of preaching by Islamists, by certain ulama, by certain Sufi sheikhs, make this long, last very long. Can I stop you here? Yeah, go ahead, yes. Certainly you make the case in your book, and you make it here now as well, that uh, the ulama have um, given a certain interpretation of Islam, um, and from your point of view, a misinterpretation. But why is it that the majority of Muslims seem to buy into their interpretation and not into yours? Now, furthermore, it's very interesting what you showed earlier that the literacy rate in Turkey was, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, was 1%, whereas it was 31% in the rest of Europe. Further, long after slavery had been outlawed in Europe, Muslims still could keep slaves, and it was, I think, just before Ataturk that uh, slavery was finally banned. It was banned in Turkey. So this slowness of development, so it's as if we Muslims are dragged, kicking and screaming by the rest of the world. As they progress, we try to latch on, and uh, we eventually get there. To give you another example, bank interest. Bank interest, riba, is haram. And uh, Maulana Maududi says that it is a haram on the level of zina. So he, in his book uh, on Islam and the state, he, he says that there can be no greater crime. And now that is also bought into by the people at the top here in Pakistan. So Ishaq Dar has said he will make Pakistan interest-free in five years. So that is something that people like you have not been able to convince the masses about, whereas the other side has been able to argue with much more conviction and they've had, they've been able to put verses of the Quran and have allowed the ulema to be effective, whereas people like you have not. What's your explanation of that? Wait and see. Maybe, <laughs> maybe in the long run, we'll have more followers. But basically, you are right so far. Why? Because the let's say the conservative side. The conservative side had more institutions. We are talking about hundreds or thousands of madrasas. And intellectual like us didn't have these resources. They have the coercive power of politics and this symbiotic relationship work well for both sides. Politicians use religious legitimacy, religious scholars impose a monopolistic discourse in the public life. But the reformist people, 
or the people who call for a rethinking also should have an internal criticism. What did we wrong? What were the mistakes we did from the 18th century to onward? There need to be a critical analysis of reform attempts too. But uh, in the long run, I am very optimistic, first of all, about Muslims in the West, Muslims in America and Europe, that's possible to see a revival of ideas. Second, agency matters, we should put efforts like this discussion and then call Muslim to rethink certain issues. Last but not least, structural changes are coming. A major change will come from the decline of oil money. The reason why now Saudi Arabia is transforming and MBS is trying to sideline the Wahhabi ulama is the fact that he sees in 10 to 20 years, oil money will not be enough to, for growing Saudi population with the depletion of oil and new technologies will replace oil. So if we put all of them together, we may really uh, have a chance to see the change. There are reasons to be optimistic, but human agency should put an effort. But it's very difficult. Why? Because uh, the preaching we keep hearing from the childhood is that if you take a risk and think differently, it, you, you can lose this word because they will say you are kafir, etc. And you may lose the, the hereafter. You can go to hell. That's why Many people afraid and they say, you know what, I will watch TV, I will play basketball. Why, why should I take risk of being a part of this discussion? So I appreciate the, the fact that you and the people in this conversation today, we, are, we came here to take some risks, but that's the only way of contributing society. So let me conclude by the Greek question, which is a great question. Just give me a few minutes, your early question. This is a big debate. Starting maybe by Ernest Renan, 19th century French philosopher, gave important speech and wrote an, a dissertation about Ibn Rushd. And his speech says that Muslims merely imitate Greek philosophy. And in my book, chapter four, I put Renan versus Seyyid Qutb as two polar opposite ideas. So people like Renan says, there is no Muslim golden age. The, the philosophers generally were atheist, agnostic, or rationalist, not true Muslims. And they merely imitate Greek. And in fact, Renan was anti-Semitic. Therefore, he didn't believe Arabs or Jews can produce philosophy. For him, only Aryan people, maybe some Persian, can produce. That's it. The other side is the Islamist counter argument. Sayyid Qutb and others says we had a great golden age because we were pious Muslims. Then the solution today is to go back to Islam. But, but if you ask what about Christianity, they became secularized and more modern and progressive. They say no, Christians are different because if they are more pious, they are backward. But we Muslims, if we are more pious, we had the golden age. So my position, and tried to, I, I wrote a whole chapter on this, both are wrong. First of all, Islamists are of course wrong. Why? Because uh, many contributors of Muslim golden age were non-Muslims. And there were Muslims, but they learned from, as you said, Greek and other uh, ancient philosophers. It wasn't a time of piety. It was a time of the golden age, was a time of coexistence certain level of toleration in the uh, and so, there was drinking and dancing in the courts of the caliphs so that's another yeah, fact. Of course, the, yeah, especially Umayyad, yeah. yes yeah and then one example ninth century Baghdad hospital the world leading hospital had chief medical doctor christian and jews 500 years later in egypt mansur hospital by the mamluks very great hospital this time said Non-Muslims cannot be doctor, non-Muslims cannot be even patient. So that's the bigotry, that's the cross mindedness follow the golden age. But so, the Greek thing, very briefly three things. First, 
there were Muslims and non-Muslim contribution of the golden age. Renan is wrong. So there were Arabs, there were Sunni Muslims, Shia as well. Second, Muslims made their own contributions. So, yes, they learned medical science from Galen, but they also criticized Galen. Yes, they learned Ptolemy, but they made their own contributions to astrophysics. And they went beyond Greek by learning math from India, by learning certain cultivation techniques from Africa, by learning paper making and other techniques from China. That's why it cannot be reduced to Greek sciences per se, but it was really an intercontinental attempt by innovations. The Czech, for example, we use today in the banking system coming from Arabic Czech. It was the Muslims who really established the foundations of modern banking system. Thank you. I completely agree that it was the openness of Muslim civilization which was the fundamental reason for its greatness for the 400 years or so. But let's leave history uh, for another day. I want to come back to the present and uh, the title of your book, Authoritarianism and uh, Underdevelopment. Okay, so now as we look at Saudi Arabia, we see that MBS is making a big change over there. He wants uh, women to drive. He, he, uh, he doesn't want the burqa over there. He wants um, uh, changes which will move it in the direction of modernity. He can do it because he derives his legitimacy from being king or soon to be king. It could well have been another person with a different personality in which case we might not have seen this kind of change in Saudi Arabia. I'll, I'll want your opinion on that. But I want you to contrast this with the kind of change that is happening in Indonesia with um, Nahdatul Ulema, who as the biggest Muslim group in Indonesia want a change in Islamic law, who want it entirely reinterpreted. So number one, if you have renounced Islam, you are not a murtad and you uh, will not be killed. Whereas the traditional punishment is killing. And this is what Maulana Maududi also and other people like Sayyid Qutb and so forth, they also say, if you leave Islam, you get killed. They say no. And they say the word kafir is to be excised thrown out of the law. So nobody can be a kafir in Indonesia. This is not what is happening in Saudi Arabia or in UAE, which are authoritarian states, but Indonesia is a democratic state and it's very peculiar. So what is your do you see Islamic law being being changed, evolving in Saudi Arabia, UAE, the other Arab states, or press and coming from compare that with Indonesia? Thank you. That's a great question. So let me start with the the the, the Indonesian part. When I first wrote the book, people were asking me whether it's about Middle East. And I was very much pay, paying attention to discussion in Pakistan. As I said, I'm very happy to hear how we are engaging about the book and this argument. And in Indonesia, in Indonesia, uh, in America, people were telling me that you wrote the book, but what about the biggest, largest Muslim country, Indonesia? They are different. Then Indonesia says that we pay attention to your book. For three reasons. One reason is that you discuss in the Muslims' early history. That's interesting. The second thing, I present Indonesia as a different case where oil money is no longer dominant because it is now oil important, not exporting country. And the Ulema State Alliance is either not exist or weak and not strong. There is no historical uh, component. In fact, when we look at the Muslim world, there are three regions of democratization, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, West Africa, Senegal, 
Unfortunately, Mali and Niger and Burkina Faso were also democracies, but they lost in the last five, six years. Then in the other corner, Albania, Bosnia, and Kosovo. I, I was in Bosnia uh, two months ago to observe the, uh, the, this kind of European Muslim majority society with a democracy. These three peripheries show if the madrasa system, ulama state, is not strong, there, there are multiple interpretations of Islam. But out of the three, most important, as you said, is Indonesia, because 200 million Muslims and Nahdat al-Ulama is a major organization claimed to have 90 million followers. Pak Yahya, their leader, came to D.C. and then I met with him. And then I went to Indonesia to meet him again. And I, what I learned is that they now try to promote what they call humanitarian Islam, saying that Sharia law is not supposed to be imposed. We have the parliament producing law in Indonesia, and they define it from a religious point of view. As you said, the term kafir should not be used for Indonesian citizens. Citizenship is what we have to pay attention. And we refuse the idea of caliphate because now it is a historical old terminology. And let me give you one example to just mention the complexity of the country. So Jakarta, the capital city, 515 to 20 million population, had a Chinese Christian mayor slash governor. So that's complexity of Indonesia. But when the same person called Ahok tried to rerun, the Islamist party sue him and make him put in prison for two years for a blasphemy charges. And then he was eliminated from the post. But then when he was released from prison, the president appoint him as the CEO of the petroleum company of the country. So it is a country where you can have a Christian Chinese mayor, but the same person could be put in jail for blasphemy. It is a complexity, but it shows all of us that is a constant struggle. It's an effort. And there is, there is hope. Yeah, thanks for bringing the issue of Indonesia. Well, things are considerably simpler here in Pakistan where <laughs> you know exactly what will happen. So I'm now going to open the, uh, the questions to the audience and uh, you can ask whatever you want of uh, Ahmad. Thank you, Professor Ahmad. I wanted to know uh, about Mustafa Akyol and Javed Ghamidi. Mustafa Akyol is, is a Turk, as you probably know, and Javed Ghamidi is a Pakistani, and both of them are in the U.S. now. So do you take them as champions of modern Islam? Thank you. So I had a graduate student from Pakistan, Farah Adit. Now he is a PhD student in Boston. He, he, when he came from Pakistan, he brought me a copy of Javid Gamedi's books, I, I read it. That, that's, that's a very good book. And Mustafa Kyo is, is a very close friend of mine. I appreciate his publications. I think he is a very important intellectual. Yes, I agree with you on this both points. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is Mohammed Qasim, a student of uh, political science from Kaidan University. So, according to your discussion, uh, from your discussion, I have concluded that there might exist a uh, uh, Vatican city for our ulamas from 8th to 11th century, uh, which ultimately led to uh, some sort of uh, secularism in the Muslim world. And then ultimately, the genie got out of the bottle and leading to this nexus. But if we consider the French Revolution, uh, which was ultimately reversed by Napoleon in 1799 and establishing a monarchy. But the French people never forget the essence of equality, liberty and fraternity, which ultimately led to many other revolutions in the 19th century, for instance, the July Revolution, etc. My question is, how is it possible for those people who had uh, lived in a relatively secular environment for almost three to four centuries, how they could be so easily tamed by some ulamas, uh, the state, the rulers, how they could be so easily tamed? 
because they ultimately had the essence uh, of uh, secularism to some sort of secularism it is complete contradiction or contrast with the french revolution or other revolutions so my question is this thank you that's a great question let me emphasize three points uh, first of all uh in the French, so my first book was on France, US, and Turkey, and the French history, political history, very problematic because there's too much back and forth. That's why they had the First Republic, Second Republic, Third Republic, Fourth Republic. It goes on. So uh, in America, we have only one republic. That that's that's more consistent. Uh, yes, they they didn't forget, but it's always come back. Monarchy come back, establishment come back. It happens. That's that's human history. The second thing is that the very important point, uh, thanks for reminding this, that it wasn't forgotten in the Muslim world. For example, the ulama state separation, even the most traditionalists are aware of there is a very strong tradition of necessity of separation in Islam. They try to cover up, deny, even the, their great leader Ghazali, Imam Ghazali, at the middle age, went to the mausoleum of Prophet Abraham and he took an oath and he said, I will never receive money from public authorities again. I will never join to gatherings of the discussion of rulers again. And I will never teach the Nizamiya madrasas. He didn't say Nizamiya, but he said the established madrasas again. And for 11 years, he followed his oath. So, and in Ihyaulu Mitin, they say the, the most read book on Islam after the Quran and Hadith books, Ghazali repeatedly says that a good scholar should not have relationship with pol uh, rulers because rulers are despotic and corrupt people. So, what I am trying to emphasize in the book has a very strong resonance in different Muslim sectors. But there is inconsistency. This is the problem. So it is very difficult to be consistent. If you ask Muslims, do we, do we want democracy? 85% say yes. But then you ask, do you like one man rule? Like Erdogan rule in Turkey or Sisi in Egypt? Maybe majority say, yeah, it's good. But these, these are in contradictory. For example, when you question Muslims, where are your scientists? Where are your great thinkers? They say, oh, we had great thinkers, Farabi, Ibn Sina, and Biruni. But if you bring them to Muslim societies today, you would put them, them in jail for being free thinkers, etc. Isn't it a contradiction? Don't you see the contradiction? So this is how we live. There are multiple discourses. So we didn't forget, if, if you ask the most conservative person, say, isn't science good? The person say, of course, there are two books. One book is revealed by God, Quran, the other universe. We have to reread the universe. I never seen someone fully deny science in Muslim society. It, it's very rare bigotry. But this inconsistency makes things very difficult. Otherwise, we didn't forget the golden age. No, we still remember it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mehmet, uh, Ahmed, for a very enlightening presentation. You very eloquently explained that it would be a little simplistic or naive and incorrect to put the entire blame on Islam, the religion itself, and on the other hand, to put the entire blame on colonization and Western imperialism. But my question does have to do with uh, today's version of Western imperialism or hegemony, or whatever we might call it, and the challenges to developing secular uh, enlightened movements in Muslim societies today. What are the challenges when we look at, for example, how such movements have been uh, deliberately uh, put down by uh, Western imperialism or its instruments, such as uh, the democratically elected government of Bhutto in Pakistan or Musaddaq in Iran 
and then Gamal Abdul Nasser in Egypt, and then the more uh, dictatorial governments, but nonetheless secular governments of the Ba'athist parties of Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein. So how do you look at this, the challenges involved, uh, uh, you know, the, the forces that we are fighting against, against, not just the conservative ulamas from our own societies, but the imperialist forces on the other side as well. Thank you. Thank you. So let me answer by three points. This is a great question. First of all, the problem we are discussing here is not confined to Muslim societies at all. I'm writing a new book on Trump's America, Netanyahu's Israel, Putin's Russia, Erdogan's Turkey, and Modi's India. In every of these five cases, you can even add Le Pen's France, though Le Pen couldn't win the election. You see a demagogue leader bringing together religion and nationalism to establish a right-wing semi-authoritarian or right-wing populist regime. This is a global problem start 40 years ago by the decline of left, left decline everywhere in Israel, in America, in Europe is declining. In India, the Congress party versus BJP, you know better than me. So this global phenomena bringing religion and nationalism together, which makes things more difficult. In the Muslim world, you refer to Nasser. At the time of Nasser, it was there was a separation kind of secular nationalist versus Islamist. Today, nationalists and Islamists are together for progressive thinkers, things becoming more difficult. Hopefully in the future, there will be uh, better chances of change, but we live in a very, very difficult time in terms of global conditions. Then came American imperialism. So every action creates a reaction. U.S. invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq were terrible. I was criticizing it them in my courses of Middle East politics in my university, and I had military students in 2006, 7, 8. They were saying that the professor, but we are bringing democracy to Iraq, etc. Today, I'm criticizing, I make the same critics, nobody defends. In the U.S. today, I don't see a single individual defending the occupation of Iraq, which was a terrible thing, for many reasons that we don't have time to discuss. But let me make a joke, which is that I, when I had a presentation in Tokyo University, Japan, a Japanese professor challenged, almost uh, attacked me saying that, how dare you impose American agenda of democratization to the Middle East? And I told him that there is no American agenda. What are you talking about? I wish there was an American agenda of democracy because the U.S. has a different agenda. Oil, avoiding Islamism, supporting Israel. Where is democracy agenda? There is no such thing. And then last but not least, you refer to secularists. As I said, secularists, modernists, reformists, whatever... You name them. I don't call myself secularist, reformist, modernist. I don't, I'm Ahmed. I don't know how to categorize myself. People try to label. But uh, the, one of the problems was the collaboration with authoritarian policies. For example, in Turkey, many uh, more modernist people support the headscarf ban for many years. That was a big mistake. So my wife had a headscarf and she, she, they, they excluded her from her profession. So many students were excluded from universities. And then people say, oh, these reformists or these modernist people are authoritarian. They don't want us to leave Islam, etc. And even today in Turkey, that's one of the reasons why Tayyip Erdogan is very popular, because of the headscarf ban that had a very negative legacy. So, therefore, any short-term strategic but immoral act, like the headscarf ban in Turkey, had a very negative long-term consequences. We should never forget this. Thank you. Just a small comment over here. There was a time when American policy was ostensibly about bringing democracy. So, if one 
recalls Jean uh, Kirkpatrick, and this is of, at the time of Ronald Reagan, there was this doctrine of uh, taking democracy to Latin America, to places like Nicaragua and um, uh, Mexico and um, uh, Brazil, everywhere over there, Chile. But that has faded out. I think that uh, America has retreated, is retreating into its shell. In fact, um, there is no appetite now even for continuing the war in Ukraine. The Republicans want to pull back from there as well. So I think American attitudes are today not what they were some decades ago. Yes, I agree. You are right, absolutely. Any other question? Ah. Hello, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, this is Harun. I'm, I'm a documentary filmmaker. All right, so, so there is this um, a view that uh, blasphemy law uh, is purely a product of uh, politics. There are probably some scholars in Pakistan who would probably disagree because they, uh, you know, quote certain traditions and they quote uh, probably a verse from Quran or two to justify it. And we see blasphemy cases, um, you know, occurring from Indonesia to Tunisia, from Iran to uh, Turkey itself. So um, do you see that as a, as a pan-Islamic phenomenon, first of all? And while, uh, I mean, there is obviously a political side to it, do you see the merits of the fact that per perhaps the original theology of Islam, you know, uh, supports an idea like that? Thank you. So very quickly, four points. First of all, yes, there are those who defend by using hadith. I, I never saw someone using a Quranic verse to support it. And second, historically, uh, it wasn't that much really imposed. It's mostly a post 11th century phenomena. Uh, and then the third thing, in some countries it exists, some is not. In Turkey, for example, uh, the, there is a law about it, but very rarely, almost never used and implemented. And yeah, these are my comments. Thank you. Um, for my question is about the role of women in Islam. I mean, um, it. how do you see that I think it is fundamentally incompatible with modernity. The whole mehram thing, the fact that she can be beaten by her husband, although lightly, and there's so many other issues. So how, how do you see that? How can that ever be made compatible with modernity, if at all? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it can only be done by interpretation, because, you know, uh, when Ibn Rush was dealing with this issue in his 12th century book about Islam and philosophy or Hikmah, Sharia and Hikmah, Islamic law and philosophy. He said that uh, there is a verse in the Quran saying that the verses in this book are either muhkam, they can be taken literal, sabit, or they are very much clearly literal, or metashabih, they are metaphorical. And only God and those who have wisdom know which words are metaphorical, which words are not. So uh, the debate is that those who have a conservative point of view put a stop uh, after God, only God knows, stop and then those who have wisdom say, Tawakkal to Allah. We just have tawakkul and submission to God. But Ibn Rush says, and many others like him says, no, you can put a stop there. Because why is the verse emphasizing wisdom and deep knowledge? Rasi, yeah, deep knowledge. Because a, a wise person can see what is metaphorical, what is not. It's It's... Therefore, it's an ongoing debate for centuries. What can we interpret? Which verses are metaphorical? Same in Christianity. In Christianity, we, uh, those who deny any interpretation call fundamentalists. 
In Islam, there are fundamentalists and non-fundamentalists. Uh, thank you for the uh, very good lecture, sir. Um, uh, in response to Professor Hoothboy's uh, question, uh, you said that uh, even after the 11th century, uh, the situation was not as dark and uh, it was only uh, just in comparable degrees. Uh, but to the extent of science, uh, if we uh, speak particularly about science, uh, this is the argument uh, usually made by the uh, people with the uh, anti-imperialist or the post-colonialist uh, outlook. Uh, who say that uh, there were still uh, many Muslim scientists, uh, but uh, they are not written about in the history of science or they are not spoken about as much uh, to undermine the contributions of Muslims. Uh, but uh, if you ask them about uh, the names of such scientists and the contributions they made, uh, they usually draw a blank. So do you have any numbers to uh, which show uh, what contributions Muslim made? Because uh, if I think about it, I draw a complete blank after like maybe the names you have mentioned, sure. Ibn sure. Sina, Alberini, uh, Alberuni. After that, we don't. I, I don't think we see any significant Muslim contribution in sciences for a very long period, maybe uh, until now. Yeah, thank you. Yes and no. So, in chapter 4, I try to document what exists after the 11th century as much as I was able to find out. And very briefly, for example, in terms of philosophy, 12th century, Ibn, uh, uh, the Ibn Tufail, and then Ibn Rushd, then all the way in the Ottoman Empire, we can continue until the time of Takayuddin, the 1570, the Istanbul Observatory of Takayuddin, an Arab scientist, uh, was put to the position by the Ottoman Grand Vizier Sokolu Mehmet Pasha. He was a, an engineer, uh, Takuyitin, working on clocks, etc. But unfortunately, two years after Sokolu's death, the Sheikh al Islam, the chief ulama, and the Sultan, they decided to destroy the observatory. And in the Ottoman Empire, 1570 was the end of science as we understand. So therefore, from 11th century to 16, there was some continuation to see with the Azerbaijani observatory established by Mongol, Mongols, then the observatory in Central Asia by Ulu Bey, the grandson of Timur, then Ali Kushchu came from Central Asia as an astronomer to Istanbul during the time of Fatih Sultan Mehmet the, in the 15th century all the way to 16th century Takuyuddin, then it ended. So, therefore, yes, from 11th to 16th century, it wasn't completely dark. There were some scientific moments, but it is dec was declining. And for from certain points, 1617, we completely lost it. I, if I might add on to this a little bit, you're completely right about uh, Takyuddin and Ulugh Beg and uh, the observatory uh, there in Turkey. But this is also the time, as you showed, of the Ottoman, the Safavi, and the Mughal Empire. These lasted, these went out roughly at the same time. And, uh, well, maybe the direct cause was imperialism, but there was no vitality within these civilizations, uh, within these empires. So let's take the Mughals. They made um, beautiful um, gardens, mosques, uh, wonderful Mausoleums. buildings, Mausoleums. mausoleums. But there was no interest in making a university, no interest in looking at the fauna and the flora. There was, when, so when the British, came to the subcontinent, they brought the products of the scientific revolution and um, um, the Mughal emperors, they looked at it and said, fine, very nice, how much can we buy this for? But there was no interest in, in discovering those principles. So there seems to be a lack of curiosity. And this is something that Bernard Lewis uh, emphasizes very strongly in his books. And I think you've referred to Lewis in your book as well. It seems to be an attitudinal problem. 
and attitudes grow out of one's nurture how one is brought up in a family in a culture and here it seems to me that that culture persists in much of the muslim world today maybe not to the extent in iran or turkey those are progressive by countries but if i look at elsewhere look at morocco or algeria or uh, even indonesia you don't see kids having that kind of uh, curiosity wanting to know and wanting to get ahead it's very different from europe it's a civilizational yeah, thank, attitude yeah. yeah thank you very much so two things very quickly one I agree with you, for example, when telescope was invented, Galileo, Kepler, other Europeans, and then came to the Muslim world, it didn't create a curiosity and well reception. That's Or even the American continent. The only book Ottomans wrote about America was written during the time of Takuyuddin Observatory 1570. One book, it's called Tarihi Hind El Garbi which means the history of West Indies. And from 1570 to almost 1800, Ottomans didn't write a book on America. It's, it's mind-blowing, the lack of curiosity. But at the same time, that, that, that's a problem we have to deal, definitely. But in, and then I look at other societies, how they keep curiosity. This is also a problem in America. That's why they encourage immigration, for example. The, 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 the Jews came with certain level of dynamism. Now many people from China, India, people like myself coming from Turkey, Middle East, they vibrate American universities, societies, because people tend to be lazy and tend to forget the importance of science and intellectual works. What is, I think, during the, let me refer, go back to Muslim Golden Age, what is important at the time was a multicultural environment like Hellenistic civilization, picking from Greek and learning from Sasian and others. What is what America is now trying to do with so many immigrants and trying to revive? Hopefully, once again, we will have more dynamism, but we should, we should be open-minded and embrace other cultures. Let me give an example of Abbasi Caliph Ma'mun, who was despotic, definitely, but at the same time, people were so open to alternative cultures at the time that he narrated a dream with Aristotle. In his dream, Abbasi Caliph Ma'mun saw Aristotle and say, oh, the guru, the uh, tell me, the wise man, what should I follow? Aristotle said, follow the reason. What is next? Follow the law. What is next? Follow the public opinion. What is next? And Aristotle said, there is no more. That's it. So they uh, publicized this dream to make the statue of political leader high. Oh, he is such a great guy. He saw Aristotle. And society was so open at that time. Today, can you imagine a Muslim society where a politician came and say, I saw Aristotle in my dream to make himself in a better position? No, people say, are you a bad Muslim? What is going on? What's wrong with you? Why did you see Aristotle in your dream? So that level of openness we lost truly today. I think that's a wonderful way to end today's uh, discussion. Oh, we can't just end it. Uh, there are some online questions because uh, this was on Facebook Live. And if, if you could give us a few more minutes. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, you may have covered some of these points. Uh, I would like to pose these questions uh, that uh, have been received on the Black Hole's Facebook page. Uh, how do economic factors interest with political authoritarianism in Muslim majority countries and what impact does this have on their development? 
Thank you. I think in all societies, economic freedom and political participation and freedom generally go together. Therefore, private property and the protection of private property, in addition to freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, of course, are important. Today, we have many authoritarian regimes because economy is controlled by central government or military institutions or some public institutions. And therefore, at least protection of private property will be very important to emphasize for the future of democratization in many Muslim majority societies. What potential strategies or approaches can be adopted to promote democratic governance and development in Muslim-majority countries uh, without undermining cultural or religious identities? Uh, very briefly, I think coalition making is very important. And if our cities are divided by sectarianism, not only Sunni Shia, but also you are from that Tariqa Sufi order, I am not, I am against your community, you are against me. This will be a divided society. A divided society, divided town can easily be ruled by a dictator. I think the only way, that, that, of course, there are m many ways like building civil society, but what I see as a problem is sectarianism or labeling each other too much division uh, and we have to, in every country, we have to emphasize citizenship, having the same city, establishing civil society. And instead of keep discussing highly politicized issues about religion or nationalism, for example, we should maybe start with practical question of parking. Not not parking of car, but having public parks in a city. So that's how European political participation began, not only about taxation and political economic issues, but also saying that we, the people of this city, what kind of monuments we will build, how we can build public parks, park for our children. So I think these are step forward to democracy. Just, just two last questions, uh, since we are running short of time. Uh, what insights can be provided to policymakers and scholars uh, working on development, uh, working on issues related to political governance, development, and Islam? So, uh, when it comes to issues like democracy, freedom, and coexistence, toleration, I'm trying to emphasize that these are not Western fantasies. These are not luxurious things we should... No, these are very efficient, effective strategies. It's not an academic fantasy to emphasize minority rights. Because today, Muslim minorities are persecuted in China, in India, in Myanmar. Even in some uh, democratic countries, there are some level of restrictions over Muslim minorities. If, for example, Muslims are, they, they care about their core religious fellows, promoting minority rights globally, isn't it a good strategy? Then it's not an American scholar's promotion of Western value. No, it is something good for Muslim Ummah if you care about Ummah to promote minority rights, to promote freedom, because all of us will benefit from this. If we put restrictions over minorities and freedoms in our societies, and others like China, India, Russia, West, will put restrictions over us. So that, that's the strategic thinking, I think, of having a long-term vision and deeper understanding of world politics we need. Okay, I think we've reached the end of the questions. I want to thank uh, Professor Kuru for taking out the time for this very illuminating and wide-ranging discussion. We've covered uh, a huge amount of material and uh, many questions were answered, many questions remain unanswered. We hope to see him in Pakistan very soon, maybe the beginning of next year. 
Thank you very much for taking out this time. Look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you.